My name is Julia and I'm on the team at Republic Real Estate. On behalf of everyone here at Republic Real Estate, thanks so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have you here. We've allotted 30 minutes for today's class. If you submitted questions in advance, we have tried to incorporate answers throughout the presentation. Republic Real Estate is the newest group at Republic. It is our vision to bring unique and high quality real estate investment offerings to the entire Republic community. Now, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Janine Yorio, who co-heads the Republic Real Estate Group. Jean has spent her career managing investments for institutional investors, including General Electric Pension Fund and other state pension funds and endowments, and has overseen more than $2 billion in real estate investments, ranging from office and apartment buildings to hotels, shopping malls, farms, and warehouses. She's a graduate of Yale University. She's now applying her 20 plus years of real estate experience to make real estate investing accessible to everyone, everywhere on Republic. Janine, over to you. Thanks, Julia. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to get started. So for those of you who are new to real estate, there are some basic things that you're going to want to learn. There are some terms you're going to see thrown around a lot. There are things like cap rate, NOI, replacement cost, property management. But I don't want to disappoint you, but we're not going to talk about any of those things today because you can find all of those things through Googling, through lots of other websites. What I want to do for you today is give you two basic rules that you can use to assess almost any real estate deal. And I believe that those two rules are actually more powerful than any of these terms that tend to confuse people who are new to real estate investing. So the first rule, you've heard it before. It's nothing new, but I'm going to give you a new framework to think about it. The most important thing when you think about real estate investing is location, location, location. You've heard this before, this isn't new. In the real estate industry, we have a shorthand that we use to describe deals that are in amazing locations. And we call it being at the center of Maine and Maine. And by that we mean it's a location that can't miss. It's got great access, it's got great visibility. Um, it's really where you wanna be. It's, it's the hub of all the activity for that particular market that it's in. And you wanna start with places you know so that you can figure out very quickly if the location is a good one. You can never move a building. So no matter how brilliant the investment may seem, if it's in a bad location, it probably can't be fixed. So now that we've covered that, I'm gonna spend the rest of the presentation today talking to you about rule number two. So rule number two is that you wanna be in the right place, location, 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 at the right time. And I wanna preface all of this by saying, I'm not advocating that you try to figure out the exact right time to invest because it's really hard, if not impossible to do. What I, what I wanna teach you today is that you already know a lot about real estate investing. You just may not think you do. You already know what locations are good. Think about the places you know, the place you grew up, the place you live in, you know where the good locations are. Now I'm gonna give you a framework so that you can start to understand timing because timing is so important to investing and to real estate investing too. So again, I want to remind you that even the best money managers will remind you that timing the market is difficult, if not impossible. To read you this quote here from Terry Smith, there are only two types of people, those who can't market time and those who don't know they can't market time. So this whole, whole class today is about market timing, but I, I disclaim all of it by saying you shouldn't try to time the market, but you do want to understand where the market timing is. So here's this graph of the real estate cycle. And all real estate investors know this graph. It looks kind of complicated, but by the end of today's class, I promise you, you're going to have a really deep understanding of this graph and why it's important to real estate investing. So look at this picture. You know you've seen cities like this. You, you, either the city you live in, a city you visited, you look up at the skyline and there are cranes everywhere. Here's another example. This is London. You look at the skyline, cranes everywhere. What does that mean? Well, that means that we are in a construction boom time in the market cycle. Now, there are two times in the market cycle when it's heading up and when the market is headed down. So when it's headed up, it's considered a seller's market. It's a great time to be building and owning and selling things. But when the market starts to trend down, it becomes more of a buyer's market. When you see those cranes on the skyline, that's how you know we're in a construction boom. We're getting close to the peak. It's almost the end of a seller's market. And any market you look at anywhere in the world, big cities, small towns, you can easily assess whether you're in a construction boom or not. And it's just by looking for signals that there's a lot of construction happening. So how do you know if you're in a different point in the cycle? You look around and you see lots of signs that say 
retail space available for sale for lease two months free rent you can tell people that own real estate the landlords are struggling to find tenants they're struggling to sell and that's how we know we're at a different point in the cycle we're starting to get into the oversupply segment of the cycle and that's the point at which you know that market has turned construction will start to taper off the aggressive developers aren't going to be building new buildings because they see there's too much space and they know that it's hard to lease it because they also are seeing those signs everywhere in their in their city. So when I first learned this rule about real estate cycles, you know, I didn't really understand what it meant. The beauty of it is, is you can go to any city that you visit and you can very quickly understand the real estate cycle that a city's in. What's also really interesting is that real estate cycles happen in a completely predictable way. They generally last about 18 and a half years. And what that means is almost every city skyline has points in time where you can look at the skyline and see when construction booms happened and when they stopped entirely. So for example, New York City, which is the city where Republic Real Estate is based and it happens to be my hometown, has a very unique and memorable skyline. And if you look closely at it, you'll see that there are certain buildings that were all built during the same time frame, And that was a construction boom in New York City. All other cities have these exact same characteristics. There are periods in time when there's lots of building, then there'll be a recession and there'll be almost no building. And if you get better and better at identifying different periods and architectural styles, you'll start to recognize when the construction booms happened in the cities and markets that you're looking at yourself. So for example, the 1920s, we all know the roaring 20s, there was a lot of wealth in this country, it was high times. New York City's skyline has tons of examples of 1920s era architecture. You can see it when you walk all around the city, the Waldorf Astoria, the Chrysler Building, so many examples of Art Deco architecture. This is Dallas, so a different market entirely, not one I know as well, but Dallas had a huge building boom in the 1980s. So when you look around Dallas, whether it's downtown or even in some of the suburban office markets, you'll see lots of examples of 1980s architecture. And that's because in Dallas during the 1980s, there was a construction boom. So I wanna go back to this chart so that you start to feel really comfortable. If you remember, I told you that it's really hard to time the market, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't feel confident about identifying where in the cycle that market is. And I've given you some quick tools so that you can use your eyes to look around a market and figure out whether we're in the construction boom period or in the oversupply and correction period. But why does all of this matter? Well, we go back to investing generally, not just real estate, but across any different kind of investing. What you want to do is try to buy low and sell high. It sounds really obvious, but it's really hard to do. So uh, some of you might be very familiar with the stock market. You're all trying to pick stocks and buy low and sell high. Now the stock market has great years, years where the stock market prices go straight up, but it's also had some really bad years. So this is a graph that shows markets when we call them bull markets, when the stock market has done really well. And then the red lines, the red area below the zero line are the bear markets. Um, periods like the 1930s, uh, the 1970s, and then the correction in 2008. So there have been points in time when the stock market corrects. Well, the real estate market is a lot like the stock market. It has these periods of bull markets and bear markets. We just call them different things. What's interesting to know is that the stock market and the real estate market don't always line up perfectly. The stock market might be doing very well, whereas different real estate markets are not. So this is a graph that shows real estate cycles dating back to 1790. And what you can see is that the real estate cycles are incredibly predictable. They almost always last roughly 18 and a half years and they happen with some regularity. So everybody thinks, oh, this market will never, will never have a downturn. Well, guess what? If history is any indication, and it's usually a very good indicator, all markets correct. All real estate mar markets have cycles have high times and low times. So why this is important is if you're really good at market timing, you want to understand the market you're in. Ideally, you buy low when the market is in recovery and you sell high at the peak right before there starts to become an oversupply situation. So here's a graph that shows US home prices. So there are different asset classes in real estate. There's residential real estate. Those are the places where people live, houses, condos, and then there's all the other real estate, which is commercial real estate. This particular chart shows housing prices in the US dating back to 1988. And what you'll see is although there are some dips in US housing prices, 
almost always they recover and they continue to trend upward. So the point of this slide is to show you that even if you get really nervous about a downturn, generally speaking, if you invest in real estate for the long term, it generally corrects and it appreciates with inflation and with other external factors. And if you're patient and have a good long term perspective, it's generally a good investment, even though there is this uh, cyclicality. What's also important to understand is that every single market is at a different point in the cycle. So this is a graph that shows you office buildings. So even within a market, so for example, in New York City, the housing market, the condo market, is not necessarily in the same point in the cycle that the office market is. The hotel market might be in a very different place than the retail shopping uh, market. So, so within a city, there are different points in the cycle. Every city in the country is also at a different point in the cycle. So this is a snapshot of the year 2015. And what you can see is that San Francisco was at the peak of the cycle. That would be that construction boom period about to crest and start toward a downturn. Meanwhile, Albuquerque, Washington, DC, and these other cities are still just getting started. They've just come off of a recession and maybe developers are just starting to think about, think about building. So you can't paint a broad brush and assume that just because one market is at one point in the cycle that all markets are there. Every market is a little different and has different external factors that drive where it is in the real estate cycle. So we go back to right place, right time. Why is that important for you to know today? Well, so we go back to this concept. We wanna buy low during the recovery, oops, and sell high. This is where I wanna teach you an insider trick. When you work on behalf of big investors like I have, a lot of what you end up spending your day doing is review, reviewing the merits of different real estate investment transactions. And there's usually tons of documentation. You know, lawyers used to roll in with boxes and boxes of leases and documentation about every building. And if you're reviewing an entire portfolio of buildings, sometimes those boxes would fill, the, fill a conference room. We used to call those data rooms or war rooms. And people would have to go in and read all those documents and try to understand the merits of a specific investment. And it's a lot of work and it's the right way to, to analyze a real estate investment, but there's a really easy hack that you can use to analyze an investment. And it, it basically boils down to what we call on the insider track, the vintage year. And a vintage year is simply, all that means is what year was the investment made? So even though the right way to analyze the deal is to read all those boxes of materials, the fact is you can make a pretty good snapshot or a pretty good quick uh, snap judgment of that investment by taking a look at which year that investment was made. And that's what we call vintage year. So what I mean by that is, let's go back to our housing price graph. If you invested in US housing generally in 1998, that was a great vintage year. Because if you held for the traditional real estate hold period, which is usually about a decade, you look like a genius. Real estate prices were trending upward. You almost couldn't make a mistake. So 1998 vintage year for housing was a great year. And I don't have to read through every box in the filing cabinet to know that 1998 probably was a great year. It's probably a good investment. Conversely, if you invested in 2005 and you held it for roughly that same period of time, you'll notice 2005 was a bumpy time. And uh, by 2015, when that particular investor might have been looking to sell, ugh, it's, it's not a great investment. It's the exact same asset class. It's just at a different point in time. So if you made investments in 2005, your performance was probably not very good. So again, I don't have to read all the documents. I can kind of make a quick judgment that a 2005 vintage year deal is a tough one, probably not that great. So this is a chart that shows how basically the vintage year of a fund can tell you very quickly whether this, this fund performed well or not, because it all boils down to that, that old concept I taught you at the beginning, which is right place, right time. And even the best investors, if they invest in a bad year, end up doing very poorly. So if you invested in 2007, we all know there was a big financial crisis in 2008, it was very difficult to recover from that bad decision. You didn't know it, it's not your fault, but it just so happened 2008 was a tough year for real estate and therefore prices declined and you had to wait a really long time for them to recover again. So as I was thinking about how to convey this message to you best, what I wanted to remind all of you of is that humans are notoriously bad at predicting market timing. Um, there, there are so many quotes you can read on the internet about why it's bad to try to time the market. 
And if you actually look at the best investors, especially in real estate, they're the investors that have a really long-term time horizon. They don't think about what's going to happen next week or next year. They think in decades. They think what's going to happen in 10 years, 20 years. So we look at this example. Everybody knows this picture. This is Rockefeller Center in Midtown Manhattan. Guess what year Rockefeller Center was built? It was built literally during the depths of the Great Depression between 1931 and 1933. Because the Rockefeller family knew that even though the economy was destroyed, the area around this was you know, filled with unemployed people and the overall sentiment was terrible, they also believed in real estate cycles and that New York City would come back. So they made a big investment at a time that was very contrarian. Very few other people were building. They were able to get labor and materials at a much lower cost. And lo and behold, now from our vantage point in 2020, they look like geniuses. They built this building at a time when nobody else was building, and now it's worth a ton of money. And we have lots of examples that we can point to. And, and again, it's all about market timing, not doing what everybody else is doing, but looking for the cyclicality. Another great example is the Empire State Building, another property that you're all probably familiar with that was also built during the Great Depression. And I'm sorry for being so New York centric, but I obviously know this city the best. But here's another great example, the Sears Tower in Chicago, which was built in the 1970s during a big recession that happened then related to oil prices. So again, a developer that had a lot of courage and built when everybody else had stopped building and was running, they understood real estate cycles and they built this building when other people weren't. So again, you're gonna get lots of conflicting advice when you invest, whether it's in real estate or the stock market. And a lot of it can be confusing. You don't know who to listen to, but what you wanna do is start developing your own internal hypothesis and confidence so that you can look at transactions, you can look at submarkets, and, and kind of start to form your own conclusions. Because the truth is, real estate is actually fairly intuitive. You already know which neighborhoods are getting better. You see new restaurants, you hear about people clamoring to live there or travel there. You already know a lot of these things. And now what I've tried to explain to you today is that you can also try to figure out on your own where in the cycle a specific real estate market is. What I wanna leave you on is this idea that obviously real estate cycles are important, but they're very difficult to predict. You can't know exactly where you are in a cycle because if people could predict it, everybody would be, would be a brilliant investor. And that's obviously not the case. The way to counteract that is to diversify. And that means don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Because remember that slide where I showed you how every market, every city is at a different point in the cycle. Well, the way to get around the cyclicality and build a really solid portfolio that's designed for the long term is to diversify across lots of different cities, to place small bets in different places, in different types of properties, so that if you're a little wrong in one place, you're not entirely wrong across your, your entire portfolio. And the beauty of a public real estate is that we bring you offerings where you can invest relatively small amounts of money and build your own customized portfolio where you can make a bigger bet in cities that you feel strongly about, but still diversify across other cities and properties that you might believe are at different points in the cycle. So that ends my presentation for today. I want to now open up the, uh, the um, for questions from the audience. Here's a question we got in advance. Um, what is the most optimal strategy for someone with limited funds to invest? So I think the thing to do is start with what you already know. It's kind of the same advice you give to people when they're starting to invest in the stock market. Think about the places you know, the kinds of real estate you understand. Usually like the gateway drug for real estate investing is re residential, whether it's a condo or a home, because you already have a home. So you understand the dynamics, you understand what tenants are looking for. You probably even understand, you know, what's, what rent is too high, what rent is too low, what kind of appliances people expect in that market. So I think residential real estate is a good way to dip your toe in the water. But I think the other way to, to do it is to look for sponsors that have a good track record, who've done this before, and who are doing projects in places that you already know and understand, and start with a small amount of money, gain your confidence, start to trust that sponsor, read all of the reporting that they share, explaining the project and its performance. And as you develop more confidence and more experience, then you can invest larger sums of money in more complicated projects. But I would say, keep it simple, stick with what you know, um, stick with markets that you understand and do your homework. Next question. The coronavirus, how do you see um, it affecting real estate investing? Um, that's such a hard one, I think, because we're not really, 
you know, the, the coronavirus is such a moving target. I think what we thought was going to happen three or four months ago has turned out to be quite different now. Like, I don't think even the smartest person would have predicted that housing prices would have remained so resilient in the face of a massive economic shutdown and so much unemployment. But there's been a lot of uh, non-obvious things that have happened in the form of government stimulus packages, um, really low interest rates, people moving to kind of country homes outside of big cities. So all of these things have happened and, and um, they seem to be happening at scale. I think that people are talking a lot about, you know, the death of office and people are not going to work in offices and they're all going to work from home. And truthfully, I believe that's a bit of a passing fad. I think after we've all worked from home from a few months, we're going to start to realize that it's really hard to to stay as motivated and connected and to collaborate remotely as it is in an office. Um, this whole work from home notion isn't new. People have been talking about it for 20 years. Lots of companies have experimented with it. And most companies start out doing it and then ultimately decide certain employees work really well at home, but a lot of them need to connect in person. And I think humans are inherently very social. Uh, I was actually talking to a, a developer today who reminded me, I don't know if you're familiar with Central Park, but Central Park is an enormous park in the center of Manhattan. Apparently Central Park was built um, in response to the cholera epidemic that hit New York City back in the mid 1800s when um, people started to be scared of living in cities and they left the city and they moved out. Like, does this sound familiar? And so the city decided that in order to attract people to come back, they would build these big open spaces where people felt safe and they didn't feel like they were at risk of catching the, the epidemic at the time. And so what you see is, is a lot of these same problems have hit cities in the past. And it turns out some humans love living in rural areas, but some humans really like living in cities. They like having a short commute. They like having you know, a very nuanced and walkable life in the city. So I think whatever near term decline we're going to see in cities, I think it's going to reverse fairly quickly after people gain confidence and comfort with whether it's a vaccine or herd immunity or just sort of a, a lower fear of coronavirus generally. I think there's going to be a return to the, city, to the city. I also think you're going to see kind of the equivalent of a roaring 20s. So after the Spanish flu in the 19, early 1900s, came the roaring 20s where people partied like rock stars for basically a decade. And I think like, I think we can all safely say that we're all kind of tired of lockdown and there's going to be a return to the good life as soon as we can. And I think real estate specifically, all the travel related real estate sectors, hospitality, membership clubs, they're gonna see a resurgence. So I'm very, I'm very optimistic about real estate long-term. I think what happens in the short term is interesting to watch, but when you invest in real estate, you should have a very long time horizon. You should think about it in, in terms of at least five to 10 years, five years, but more like 10 years or longer, because there are these deep cycles. We will make mistakes, but long-term good real estate is an appreciating asset and it's got a scarcity value. You know, good locations are few and far between. So if you make an investment in a project that's well-located, it should appreciate with time pretty much without fail, especially if you can hold for the long-term. Next question. What does the future of real estate crowdfunding look like? I think that um, we're already starting to see some really strong sponsors come to crowdfunding. Retail investors are becoming very sophisticated, very discerning, very international. They want good investments. They want things that are differentiated. Today, they're very focused on income because interest rates are so low and it's so hard to find yield in this environment. But I think, I think crowdfunding is only going to get better. Uh, I think you're going to find that the like, Republic's vision is to become the Amazon of investing, where you can literally search by different categories, geographies, um, and find investments that satisfy your desire to invest in that category. And I think that's what's going to happen with crowdfunding. And, and I think crowdfunding, the name sounds really small, but the opportunity is enormous. Investment is an enormous category everybody wants to invest they all, everybody means to start setting aside money to invest and the more manageable we can make it for people of all different socioeconomic strata the more um the more kind of interesting the opportunity becomes because you can invest in literally everything and real estate is no different if you walk down a street and look up everything made of bricks or stone or wood is real estate and it has an investor somewhere and why isn't it you? You know, historically, it's always been kind of the upper 1% who are, 
who have had both the access and the means to invest. And that needn't be the case long term. If we bring the dollar amount and the accessibility down using technology, then everybody can own little pieces of those city streets and those town streets that you walk down where you see the real estate all around you. What cities is Republic Real Estate looking at? I mean, we're pretty agnostic. We look at lots of different cities. Um, you know, we personally have our favorites, but I think if, if you ask 10 people what they think the 10 best cities for investment are, some cities will, you know, come up time and again, but there are lots of cities that, um, you know, are sleepers that other people like. We try to be open-minded because there, there are good investments to be had in all different places all around the world. I'm really excited about a lot of US cities, but I'm also really excited about international cities. Um, I think American investors are interested in investing overseas and foreign investors are in interested in investing here. And the simpler we can make the process, the more we can let people uh, make those kinds of investments. Thank you so much, Janine, for such a great overview of real estate cycles, TG and Julia for uh, your introduction and help answering questions. And with that, we wish you an amazing day and see you at our next webinar. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.